Hi everyone, I'm Tom and today I'm going to be playing Res Arcana, which is an engine building card game all about battling mages from designer Tom Leman, who is the designer of Race for the Galaxy, co-designer of Roll for the Galaxy, of pandemic expansions, of all sorts of things. So in this game, Marty and I will be playing mages. Marty is going to be the druid and I am the seer. The mages give us some unique special abilities, maybe some resources round by round. We each have a deck of eight artifact cards, and this is just completely randomly done. There are some starting setups that you can use where it gives you a particular hand of cards. You see there's, I don't know if you can see from this angle, we'll zoom in later. Uh, there are some numbers in the cards where you can start with predetermined hands for your first few games, or there is a draft variant where you can draft the cards. But I'm just playing with the standard, shuffle them up, and before the game starts, you can look through your deck because this is the only deck you're getting the whole game. You've got these eight cards, and a huge part of the game is looking at what you've got, seeing how an engine can be built, seeing what combos you can get with the different cards. One gets your resources, one spends those resources to do something, and you are going to be trying to get monuments, get places of power, which are the big points generators, all in a race to 10 points. And at the moment, I'm winning. I'm first player, and I've got one point to start the game with. So let's just stop there, shall we? No? Okay, then let's go to the first turn. So before we zoom in, we can do the first part of a round, which is collect essences. Now, this is basically all of these abilities with this little hand symbol on that we'll see a little bit closer in a second. You get the resources from them. So at the moment, we have no cards out. These are our hands. We just have our mages. And Marty's happens to get him a green resource, a life. And he also starts with an item. He got first pick. And down to the cards that are in his artifact deck and the cards that he started the game with, he can choose to start with a Calm or an Ilan, so a blue or a red, basically. So he's definitely getting a green, and he's going to choose a red, because you start off with one of each resource. He would like two reds to get one of his cards out. There we go. And for me, I have a blue, thanks to my Seer, and I also get to choose between a death and a life, so a black or a green. I am going to go for a black. So I get a black and a blue there. And now we're ready to start. Oh, and just before we do, I highly recommend you turn on Klingon subtitles because that's where the mistakes are noted up. And if I've made any, you can put yourself right. So here is my play area. And we can look at the round summary. Freeze frame, so I'm not shaking it. And what we can do now is actions, one per turn. So it'll start off with me and then it'll move on to Marty's action and we'll go backwards and forwards until we have both passed. So the things we can do on our turn, we can place an artifact, that's these cards that we start with, start with three in our hand, and we're going to be getting one per turn probably. So yeah, you can get them all out, but you're not going to get as many back. So what have I started with? I've started with a creature, a dragon, and the fountain of youth, and they all do quite different things. So the Celestial Horse will give me a collect power, so at the start of the round I can get myself two of any resource, but they can't be gold or death. That's what that little symbol there means. I have a Water Dragon. Dragons in this game are pretty much for attacking. It does get you a point to get it out, but it's very expensive to get out. It's going to cost six calm, six blue to get that dragon out. And you can tap him, so basically every round I will get to cause all of my rivals to lose two of their life, their green resources. If they don't have enough life to lose, they lose double of some other resources. They can avoid it by spending Ilan, fire, basically, <laughs> I'm sure why it's not called fire, uh, to ignore that damage. And the Fountain of Youth has another collectability, so it would get me a life, a green and it has an ability on the bottom that doesn't require the card to be tapped. I can do it as many times as I have resources for. I can spend two death to put two calm, and I'm just going to say the colours, two blue and a green on this card. And that basically means when you put resources on the cards, it means you, you can have those resources, but you take them off the card in the collect essences step. So, you know, when you do all of these abilities you can choose to remove resources from cards and you, you don't have to take them off but if you take any off a card, you have to take them all off a card. There are, of course, more things that you can do than just get an artifact card out, but that's what I'm going to do to start the game with. Now, I have purposely arranged it 
so that I will have enough resources for a couple of the cards that I want to play. I'm going to get the Celestial Horse out straight away because starting from next round, I will start to generate more resources. And the more resources I have, the more stuff that I can get out. So to do that, I need to pay two blue and a red, which I have. And now my Celestial Horse can go out into play, but it has no ability to do it. It's just a collect ability that's going to come later on. On to Marty with a pretty similar setup. And he is going to start out the game in a bit of a nasty way, actually. Well, let's let's go, let's have a look at what he's got. He's got the Corrupt Altar. Costs three of anything and two death to get out. So very expensive at the start of the game. It will give you a death and a life, though, to you know when you do your collect resources. Permanent ability, so as many times as you want, as soon as you've got this out, you can spend two life to put three fire on here, three red. And it goes on the card, so, you know, that's just basically a delaying thing. You can't have it this round, but you can have it next round. And it has a special ability. You can tap it to destroy any of your artifacts, including the Corrupt Altar itself, and you gain its placement cost plus two extra resources, but those two extra can't be gold. The Vault costs a gold and anything else to get out. And you can tap it to put gold on the card. And gold is a hard thing to get in this game. If you leave gold on the card, though, in the collect step, you know, when you can take everything off the other cards, if you leave gold on, then you can put two of any resource apart from gold on here. So it's basically interesting, you know, like a bank. And this is a way that you can kind of have longer term plans and collect a load of resources, get them all off and spend, spend, spend. The Elvish Bow costs two red and a green to get out and is basically you can either tap it to draw a card or attack it's not as powerful as a dragon attack it just makes everyone lose one life but yeah it could still be quite annoying guess what marty's going to do first he's going to play that elvish bow so that's going to cost him two red and a green back to me and if i had plans for my life i can see it's about to disappear when it's marty's turn again fortunately i've got no way of spending that whatsoever what I am going to do, though, is use a different action. You can discard any of your cards for either one gold or two other essences. So the Water Dragon, there's no chance I'm affording that for ages and ages and ages. So I'm going to discard this card and get myself a Death and a Blue, a Calm. I haven't actually put my resources on screen there, have I? <laughs> I'm closer in. And your discard pile is supposed to go under your deck like that, and anyone's allowed to look at your discard pile at any time. For Marty's turn, he is absolutely going to use his Elvish Bow to make everybody, but in a two-player game, that's meaningless, to make me lose one life. I now have enough resources for my Fountain of Youth, so I'll spend a blue and a black to get that out, but I won't be able to use its ability until my next turn. Over to Marty, he is going to spend a gold and, let's say a life since he can collect more life later on because it can be anything that he wants and he's going to get the vault out there back to me i don't have anything in my hand but i do have abilities i can use i'm going to use the fountain of youth's ability here to spend two black and then i get two blue and a green onto the card that's what this symbol always means back to marty he isn't really going to get use out of his druid ability just yet this lets him tap the druid to untap a creature. Now, that he has got at least one creature in his deck, but uh, it hasn't come out yet. So he's got the vault to use, and the, tapping the vault basically puts a gold on it. So grab that from the supply, and he can take that straight off, or he can leave it on and get two resources every single round. My ability, though, I can use. This lets me draw three cards from my deck, reorder them, and put them back. So if I really want something out, I can have a look at what would be coming. So I have the Tree of Life, the Ring of Midas, the Sea Serpent. Sea Serpent is just another dragon. Everyone loses two life. This one costs six blue and three green to get out, but it is a dragon and a creature. So abilities that would apply to either of those all apply to the Sea Serpent there. The Tree of Life, you tap it to get three life, but everyone else gains one. That's a bit of a downside. You can react to attacks by spending a life to ignore them. But that's only dragon attacks, not Marty's elvish bow. And it would be silly to defend against the elvish bow with it because you would spend a life to stop losing a life. The Ring of Midas is worth a point. And so is the Sea Serpent. 
But this could be a good combo here because this generates a load of life, even though it does give Marty some. This, you spend two life to put gold on it. And you can tap it to put gold on it as well. And gold can be very, very useful for gaining monuments. I can also use my power on the monuments deck. And I'll show you the other things in just a second. So what order do I want these in? Now, it's about having the resources to be able to put these into practice. I'm only going to get to draw one thing at a time. And I'm not going to be able to get to, to discard a card for resources if I want to get these out. So I think I'm going, to, I'm going to put them in this order. The Tree of Life first, then the Ring of Midas, then the Sea Serpent. Unfortunately, though, I want those top two cards. So other things we're going to be doing as the game goes on. I can use my power on the Monuments deck as well to draw three cards and reorder them on the top of it. Monuments always cost four gold, but gold can be quite hard to come by. The obelisk here is a point, and when you buy it, you get six essences. They can't be gold, though. The mausoleum, you can do an action to basically turn... You spend anything and put a death on here, and it's worth two points. And then we have the five places of power. Very, very expensive things to get, but they offer abilities that generally relate to earning some points. So the sacred grove here... Its powers relate to getting you a load of life and putting life on the place of power. The place of power is worth two points plus one for every life that's on the card. So that could be really, really lucrative and could uh, tip you off to victory. There are some different things, though. The Coral Castle here is worth three points and you can tap it to ignore an attack, but also to check victory now because we normally only check at the very end of the round. And, you know, if, uh, if two of you are racing for it, you can trigger the victory condition first if you just manage to tip the victory over someone else. But we'll see more of those later on. We're back to Marty's turn now, though. And although he does have some resources, he has a card that he can't afford to get out. He could discard it for some resources. But I think he's better off waiting until he knows what's coming up. So he's going to hang on to that and he's going to pass. When you pass, you take the first player token. And so you have earned yourself a point. You have to swap your magic item for another item. So this one has to go back. So being the first to pass, he hasn't got access to the item that I had. So he can take divination, tap this to draw three cards to your hand and then discard three. Research, tap it and pay a resource to draw a card. Alchemy, tap it and spend four resources to get two gold. Reanimate, tap it and spend a resource to untap something. Transmutation, tap it and spend three resources to get three resources, but they can't be gold. And Protection, react to an attack, tap this to ignore it. Now I think maybe Marty wants to try and get his creature out so he can start using his druid's ability. So he's going to take Divination here, which is the one that lets him tap it to draw three cards, put them in your hand and then discard three. Finally, he gets to draw a card, which is going to be the Hypnotic Basin. Costs... Two blue, a red, and a black to get out. It's going to get you two blue in the collect phase, and you can tap it to gain blue equal to the red of arrival. So that would be great. If I was gathering a load of red, I don't think I'm going to be doing that. Might be one to discard from Marty, but it, it does give you a nice collectability. Okay, it's time for me to pass then. I am not the first to pass, so I don't take the first player token and the point. So what would I like? Now, I don't know what's coming into my hand just yet. So, I'm not sure. Do I just want to get some more resources, the one Marty had last turn? So I only have a gold at the moment. That's, that's it. Yeah, I think I'm going to take that. Then I draw a card, which is basically my hand for this turn, and I know what it is, don't I? It's that Tree of Life. We've been through this. And the last thing that happens in a round is check for victory. Does any player have 10 or more points? No, if not, straighten all your components and begin the next round. So that is the first round of Res Arcana. There are, the rulebook says there's usually four to six rounds in a game. I am going to go all the way to the end, and that's going to be in part two. It's going to be linked in the corner or in the description if you want to see some more battling mages. If you just want to know what I think, then you can click another link somewhere over here to go to that instead. But it's up to you. Thank you very much for watching up to now, and I'll see you for the next game. Bye, everyone.